Uh, in, in in what way? I I I post. Typically, when I meet people, I just post it on our YouTube because uh, there's a bunch of people, a bunch of our developers that are following our thread and all that. So uh, when I refer to various work, it's like I say, hey, take a look at the video for what we talked about. That's what I do. Cool. That sounds fine. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, how familiar are you with our work there? I, I'm, I don't know as far as uh, manufacturing change. Can you update me on that? As far as our work, our work has been going on for about a decade. i just give you a brief intro and then maybe you can tell me what, what you're up to. But uh, So I'm, um, we actually met once, um, I don't know if you remember, but um, oh, um, we did. it was at a, we were both presenting at a conference in Hamburg um, at the, ah. Um, so the initiative I was working on then was called Make a Net. Yeah. Um, at and HSU, yeah, so we, you're talking about? That's it. That's the, that's what ah, I was trying okay, to remember. Okay. Yeah, oh, HSU. I forgot that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Cool. Um, um, yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm familiar with your work. I'm, I'm, okay. Um, I also know um, Martin Hauer. Um, okay. I think um, he's OSE Germany, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Um, so he has worked on a couple of projects that I've been involved in over the last couple okay. of years about mm -hmm. um, that are being done under the Internet Production Alliance that are around um, creating open standards, open data standards for different different things. Yeah. Um, one for do hardware documentation and one for mapping of manufacturing capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, um, I'm. What reasonably familiar with your work but i'd love an update and to, to know where you've got to yeah right so so i think um some of the latest projects latest work here is actually it's really on an enterprise front in terms of developing the enterprise because we've been doing a lot of proof of concept and then it's now time to to really roll the work out we've done the cd co home which is a structure i'm actually in right now um Right now, we're doing things like selling, building and selling 3D printers. We run workshops and Steam camps. Okay. Uh, so a revenue model. We have pretty much developed a revenue model where between selling kits and running build workshops, immersion trainings, we can make, make buy. Uh, but the next step is uh, to solve for the big issue of how to get a lot of people to show up to get hardware projects to completion. So right now, actually, we're planning a big, big event that addresses the people showing up issue and that is to collect 2,000 people for a weekend, kind of like a sprint that will be remote on the house itself to deliver a remarkable product, which we've done a lot of work on, like the CD Co home. So the promise there is to develop a thousand square foot house that you can build with a friend in one week uh, for $50,000 in materials that would cost you. Um, so that kind of a package, that's our latest thing to basically say, okay, we're gonna gather a carefully crafted architecture of people, collaboration architecture of people that can make this happen. So we pretty much fill in during that time, fill, well, first of all, prepare for that, align everybody to coordinate. It's a huge coordination task. But at that point, publish something like a thousand or 2000 page document, which has everything from your design to the enterprise aspect. So we'll include mm -hmm. the enterprise development issues including developing the website marketing assets and the whole product around the house so it's a, it's a crazy thing it's combining kind of like the startup uh, startup camp with a hackathon the new thing there is that I think so, the, so sorry I just yeah. I just want to make sure I'm understanding you so um, you're teaching people not only how to build the house but how to set that house up as a business as well yeah exactly so out and, of the, the, and the business is making other houses yeah or okay the, the right, idea specifically it. is out of the 2,000 people we're aiming for 200 entrepreneurs that are gonna build 10 houses over that next year each mm -hmm. so it's uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's got the execution part in that too so and that is to address that question that's never, I don't think it's ever been addressed in hardware, which is how do you get to a product, a finished product, on any kind of a predictable time scale? You know, so outside of like small heroic yeah. efforts, can you actually leverage car collaboration? The new thing that we think is new here is just the idea that we're all working together. Like if you take a look at any incentive challenge, I've not seen any incentive challenge which is not competitive 
or put it in another way, I've never seen an incentive challenge which is collaborative. Yeah. It's about a, about yeah. a b- bunch of teams c- competing. So what happens if you actually collaborate? I mean, it's like it's a complete no brainer. But for some reason, it hasn't happened yet. Um, so I think I think it's time to make it happen. And I'm trying to study that for what the closest examples are. But it's the closest examples are quite far from the mark, it seems. So we'll see what happens. And uh, with a lot of promise on it, we think we've got the design pretty good i mean we've done i mean we've done a lot of building construction from cb to to stick frame like panelized construction but all the results are really positive as far as how through an integrated effort of knowledge management and skills integration you're just cutting costs on you know the r d costs the just optimizing for every aspect of the system i think this could be uh, <coughs> what alistair parvin talks about with the wiki house delivering housing without debt kind of deal so that's really delivering on the kind of promises i think he made in his seminal writing on uh, i don't know if you've seen his article it's called housing without debt he wrote about you know the wiki from which i haven't House. read it um, yeah yeah i'm, I'm yeah. familiar with it i haven't yeah. i'm not sure of that article but yeah um, yeah it's a good one uh, but that's kind of what we're trying to execute on the the, the kind of uh, framework that he's describing there which is he's got it all cut cut and you know, cut and dry. Well, it's kind of, I think kind of figure out. I think we know the solutions, but it's, it's execution is hard. So it's once again getting to that execution part. For is, sure, is the deal. So, so yeah. So yeah. which of the um, machines in the Global Village Construction set have you got kind of completed designs for now? Because um, I think last the time four. we talked was I think it, the sort of brick maker and the 3D printer from memory were the ones that you had. Yeah. Sort of solid designs for. The house and the tractor, uh, CNC torch table, micro tractor. Those are all pretty much. Uh, also, a circuit mill. Um, those are all ready for product releases. I mean, it's a question of taking all those to the finish line in terms of uh, viable businesses. So we're really getting the three D printer business off the ground right now, but it looks like through this. Um, the recent events with COVID and stuff, the the housing part is really motivated. It's like let's solve a real issue right now, you know. And it made me think about that. But we're gonna push the house, so there's gonna be uh, looks like the 3D printer and the house are gonna be some of the first products that we're gonna uh, get out there in a hopefully a major way. So that's that's okay. where we're at. And uh, the perennial question that's still outstanding though is the open source microfactory specification. I think you. You mentioned about okay, what are the places that have machines? But what is the what is the spec for this this kind of open source microfactory infrastructure that would allow this to scale rapidly around the world? It's kind of a thing that's under the rug, it's still not not been addressed, and um, it's, it's one of the gaps in the open hardware community. So I was actually going to ask you if what what are your uh, your latest thoughts on it? You mentioned about the um, mapping out the fabrication capacity, so. With the Open Know How Group, so you're involved in the Open Know How Group there. So um, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm less involved in Open Know How. Um, so that's the one that has um, been defining a, a standard f- for um, documentation of open hardware projects, mm-hmm. um, with the initial aim just being discoverability, just like how do you figure out what's out there. Yeah. Um, but with the aim to to go for, for further into um, uh, portability, so people don't get locked into one platform, but are actually able to you know share a design to multiple places mm-hmm. uh, and retain ownership of the design and take it away from a platform and take it somewhere else if they want to, um, and you know and ultimately interoperability, so that you can yeah, um, I mean. Mm-hmm. I don't. I yeah. don't see it as ever being realistic that there's going to be everybody is going to centralise um, their open hardware designs onto one repository, and that's the place that you look for it. Um, I think that there are there's so many platforms out yeah. there. People have you know for different purposes. People have their own favourites, and, and rightly so. And what we need is some kind of you know meta search capability that allows you to look for things across platforms. Um, you know to actually be able to figure out what is what is there. So. So that's the problem that Open Know How is, is trying to solve. Mm-hmm. Um, and that we would, um, went through a sort of you know, 
community standard building exercise last year um, released a first version of the standard in I think it was about September time and since then um, there's been sort of ongoing work to you know just to, to move things forward to drive adoption of it which is actually going really well um, and to you know start moving towards next versions of the standard that will aim to be um, to do a bit more so then um, we've also this year kicked off an exercise that we're calling Open Nowhere, um, which is around mapping of, of manufacturing capabilities. Now, um, I'm, I'm based in the UK, but the, mm -hmm. um, my real interest is in like small scale manufacturing in developing countries and how can we enable communities in, in remote places to make the stuff that they need. Um, so I actually come, um, I came from a, a supply chain background, I used to work on global supply chains um, and then got into global health um, and was like m working on supply chains to get medicines and medical devices into you know, some of the poorest countries on earth. And that was when I started you know, looking at this and thinking, this is crazy, why are we trying to move all this stuff everywhere? Yeah. Um, you know, where, where in places where there's so little supply chain infrastructure. Um, that it's incredibly difficult to do and all you can do is put loads and loads of inventory in the system and hope for the best um, right. whereas you know there is the we now have the technological possibility um, for people to start making what they need much closer to where they need it so that's yeah. the area that really really interests me um, so open nowhere is about um, understanding what um, manufacturing capability exists in a place and we're, we're trying to again we're working on developing an open data standard so we're not trying to do the mapping ourselves which we um, there are a lot of different efforts that are done to map things like mm -hmm. ranging from I mean you have okay you have like the fab lab network or something that has you know data on all of their places you have some platforms that are setting up you know like wiki factory like um, 3D hubs, all of these kind of things that have a having a business model around, you know, displaying maps of different types of manufacturing capacity. Um, mm -hmm. You have like grassroots efforts, like um, there's the hackerspace in Cairo that went and mapped all of the um, artisans in the back streets around them. Like they wanted to know who can make what. Mm -hmm. um, there are NGOs like Field Ready that I work like, quite closely with that, as part of their work, will kind of map something like. Um, where are all the 3D printers in Nepal or um, where are the injection molding factories in the in the Pacific Islands mm -hmm. um, and it's about uh, not, these data sets are being collected but there's never any way that you can um, you know look across them or add anything up um, mm. or do much, much sensible with them so we're trying to develop a, a data standard that is going to enable um, information to be basically you know, to become um, sensible so that you can know what, you can compare apples to apples and pears to pears and you can mm -hmm. actually start to um, aggregate up some of this data and, and look at questions like, you know, what, what, is the, um, what is the manufacturing capability across a particular area um, or, you know, where can I make something and that's mm -hmm. where it'll come back to the, um, the hardware uh, documentation standard and like if I've got a product that needs these particular machines where can I find those machines to go map them yeah this is open nowhere and like know how yeah. nowhere is that a, is there a yeah. website yet or uh, yes there uh, there's not really a web much of a website for open nowhere um, there would so these are being done there's a group of people um, an organization that's sort of forming a nascent alliance called the Internet of Production Alliance. Um, and we're just in the process of um, developing a website for it. And it's kind of, I'm not, so I've seen content that we've been reviewing and I'm not sure if anything on Open Nowhere is actually on the published version yet. And it doesn't look to me like it is. Mm -hmm. um, there's stuff on Open Know How about that. Um, but the other thing I can do for Open Nowhere is afterwards I can ping you. There's um, a wiki that um, talks about the project and you know documents all of the conversations and things that we're having about it. So um, I'll send you that link afterwards. Yeah. As far as, uh, is anyone working on the actual 
spec for the machines that are in the in these open nowhere places or <laughs> that, that that list i think so, i've seen something on that so we've we've had a subgroup on on equipment um that is i mean what we're trying to do at the moment is is really quite basic it's just to like decide what is the information that we absolutely need to capture in order to characterize a machine that is somewhere um and we've got uh i'm just trying to remember where this one was the equipment group is it's, it hasn't got a finalized proposal um it's got there's a um so for the whole thing we've got a data model that's in you know in iteration um but so, but yeah on, on the equipment piece discussions are ongoing um mm -hmm. but if that's something you're particularly interested in you'd be more than welcome to join the working group and and contribute to those discussions um working group we're with, aiming and this is uh, with what group this, this is with open know-how this is with open nowhere um there's a, a, um, okay. a, a subgroup within that looking at how we characterize equipment okay. um yeah um i can send you some information on that afterwards yeah um, who's heading that are, are you heading that or um i'm chairing the the working group yeah um it's being okay. funded by the shuttleworth foundation um the funding has come via um andrew lamb who's a colleague yeah. of mine i've been working with for years yeah yeah and there's an organization called Barbel that we're working with who are doing the technical standard documentation. Um, but it's a it's an open, you know, publicly documented community effort to um, to create the standard. Um, what is that called? Barbel, you just said Barbel? Uh, Barbel, B-A-R-B-A-L. B-A-L. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Review and iterate technical documents with less pain and more control. Yeah. Uh, I see that. Okay. Uh, is that an open source platform or? Um. I I'm so I'm not into software at all. I, d I know there are different. Uh, it, it's <laughs> I don't know if it's um, completely if the platform itself is completely open, but the process that they're using. To documentation process is open yeah um, okay yeah yeah so and as far as the maker makernet Alliance is there other stuff going on Do, are you familiar with how, how close are you to the makernet al Alliance so um, we've we've that's what we've now renamed the Internet of Production Alliance okay um, and it's um, yeah it's that's going pretty well it's still at the moment a loose alliance but one of the things we've got going on is conversations about setting up um an, an entity um or, or taking over one that belonged to one of our members um um and yeah it's it's a sort of reasonably active community everyone's got day jobs um but there's you know there's a lot of common um, ambition and uh, you know people are fundraising for things that we can work on together and the um, the different standards efforts are being done under the, the Internet Production Alliance mm -hmm. um, and we're yeah um, we're looking at um, developing more kind of um, some, some more technical proof of concept stuff as mm. we um, as we move forward yeah yeah I'm definitely interested in uh, the discussions around the equipment base because something like uh like there's the DIN spec 3105 now. Um, maybe there could be one. Is that the one, is that, the one that Martin got past yeah, or is Martin that the, this is a different DIN spec? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's right. And something like that that lays it out clearly for what, like if you're doing open source production, what that infrastructure looks like. So aiming towards that. Uh, uh, I'd really like to see that happen because that that's you know once you have the open data for product design I mean then you need to manufacture that so it's the it's, it's down the road I think uh, but to standardize that would be important in a sense of then this has a real chance to spread spread widely and to all places around the world for, for true collaboration like I talk about the concept of tool chain degeneracy which is that 
uh, unless you have similar or reasonably similar tool chains you cannot really you cannot really re reproduce another person's work effectively so so quality control mm -hmm. or distrib like distributed production ma management or distributed quality control is completely impossible and nobody has really heard of distributed quality control how do you do that well no, i don't think anybody really does it but i think there's potential it, it's something that. i've really looked into um oh, yeah. yeah there's um I haven't so yeah it's a topic I'm really interested in I agree there are no there are no good solutions there are some some sort of interesting avenues but it's definitely a big issue yeah yeah um, any any thoughts on that what were your conclusions at the time or or is anyone actively working on this this kind of or that you know of um, no I don't know so there's a couple of different angles that, that we've kind of come up this at so um, a a colleague of mine um, a couple of years ago was working on um, well no that's let me not start there so there are some tools that have been used in construction industry quality control that I mm. think are quite in interesting so um, in Nepal um, after the earthquake there was um, huge amounts of, of rebuilding which needed to be done to to meet earthquake proof specifications and there are massive problems with traveling around the country and problems with having um, you know highly qualified engineers in different places and so on mm -hmm. so there's an organization um, whose name is not at the tip of my tongue but I, well, I will have in my notes mm -hmm. Um, oh, field sites they were called. Um, field what? Who, field site I think they were called. Field site. Um, and they were doing a uh, basically an app that would allow that would um, allow for sort of remote inspection by qualified mm -hmm. um, engineers, so that you know people would have to kind of would you know build something to a certain point and then yeah. have to get it signed off remotely before it could continue yeah. and stuff like that so <laughs> so that was one approach um is, is that an app that exists right now or that yeah um it was it was working for yeah for construction um field site app or? i'm sh pretty sure it was called field site um because that's actually highly relevant like when we talk about so with a housing project with a CD go home that we're doing as we yeah, build it out be. yeah because it's going to be actually owner builder okay so we're going to have to do remote quality I, control i've just found a fieldsite.com but that's not the right thing that's not the company i might have got the name wrong i'll look it up later mm -hmm. no no app.fieldsite.org humanitarian digital platform for project monitoring and infrastructure oh. quality assurance Uh, can you send a link? I'm not, you got I'm it? not getting it. App.fieldsite.org. Um, I've just brought it up on my laptop and I'm talking to you on my phone, so I can't paste Field the site? Yep. That like org. seeing something. App.fieldsite.org. Uh, can you see the chat? Is that... Did I spell it right? Because that's just not coming up for me. Okay, yeah. No, that's what I've got. Huh. wonder why it's not... HTTP oh, no, so sorry. Sorry. Site like C, not site like a place. S-I-G-H-T. Oh. Ah. I see it. Okay. Um, first human time digital platform design to... Oh, cool. Oh, wow. So that's being used in Nepal and other places or just Nepal? Or? I, I, I don't know. It's, so it's huh. at least 18 months since I've spoken to them. Um, I don't know the, the latest, but hmm. yeah, it, it was being used in Nepal, definitely. Nice, nice. We might, might use it if the thing works, yeah. yeah. That's good. Um, 
So that there's that approach. There's obviously plenty of people do the centralization approach, which is get the stuff made remotely and then mm -hmm. get it sent into a, to a certain place, central place, which is not very scalable at all. Mm -hmm. um, another approach that we've done a sort of a bit of experimentation with is is the sort of the pull approach um, via business models. So. Um, uh, colleague of mine built a blockchain prototype that was um, basically having a, it was a distributed contracting system with quality control steps built in so that you would have you could have multiple um, places you know producing parts of an order and um, having to get some parts of the order signed off um, by a an approved quality mm. agent who um, in our trial was centralized but who could become decentralized mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and basically you know you have to um, you'd have to get approval before you could make the next bit and it's you know as long as you've got the quality levels specified up front which of course is a very tricky issue in itself but if you mm -hmm. do that right um, and then use a you know yeah, a blockchain for that, then you can make. So our theory is, and it's not been tested, but the theory is that that would drive quality um, compliance because people would know it's precisely baked into whether the money gets released at the end or not. Mm, nice. um, yeah. But that's something uh, that we haven't been able to trial on a large scale yet. But uh, we'd love to do if we can get funding to, to try that. What is that called? Um. We, we were doing that under Makernet at the time. Um, mm -hmm. who, was, who was involved? Who was your colleague there? It was a guy called Daniel Paterson. Hmm. Um, and he uh, and Field Ready tried that also in Nepal, in fact, the trial was done. I see. Oh. Are they actively developing on this topic, or as far as field ready? No, we, um, no, we would we would love to do more work on it, but mm -hmm. it's a question of getting funding to do that work. Yeah. And how is field ready doing these days? I mean, so they're they're expanding, they're they're doing well. They're mm -hmm. and their yep. main main thrust, like right now, is I mean, it's, it's all a bunch of different projects around, or do they have a particular focus or um, my understanding, and I'm, you know, I'm not, I, I speak to Andrew very frequently, but not mm -hmm. so often about field ready stuff. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not the, the most in the loop, but um, they basically as a humanitarian organization, they're trying to make aid supplies close to the point where they're needed. Um, but as part of that, they do a lot of stuff, which is, do a lot of experiments, which is very relevant to um, you know, to the kind of things that we're, we're interested in. So um, one of the, the projects that they've um, had going on is uh, making so buckets for water collection, mm -hmm. um, trying a different approach to the aid system for them, which used to be get them all injection molded in one place, store them in huge warehouses mm -hmm. and then fly them into somewhere where there's a disaster. Um, and they've actually had tooling made for to injection mold those buckets so that the tooling can be moved into a, um, a disaster zone and use locally available feedstocks and local injection molding factories to to produce them and um, that's one thing they've been working on um, they've just got a big um, grant to do work in Bangladesh, Iraq, Kenya and Uganda, which is going to include some mapping of manufacturing capability doing the um, using the open nowhere standard um, that's being developed. I think it's a kind of it's a I think the project is like a mapping of uh, what the local capability is compared to what the humanitarian need is and how those things can be matched at a much more local level rather than bringing stuff in from all over the globe. Yeah. Um, they're involved in a bunch of stuff that I don't all know, know about, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So.
so yeah I don't have any particular specific questions I just wanted to really touch in on the state of the the open source manufacturing capacity spec the, the actual machine spec but yeah so if you can connect me to like some of the people working on sure. that so um, I in in my in the world that I'm involved in um, I mean I love the idea of being able to specify the the machines and, and say you know it's going to be like this and have them everywhere but I in the the way I s at the moment see faster scaling in the developing world is mm. by tapping into the existing manufacturing base out there mm. um, because you know there's actually a lot of um, you know welders and mm -hmm. smallish scale injection molders and carpenters and you know lathes and, and all kind of you know tools that it can be tapped into but that aren't being um, and I really see that as, as quite an urgent need mm -hmm. um, yeah yeah I'm, all, huh. I'm also particularly interested in any machines um, you have that uh, that kind of enable business models by themselves, like the, the idea of the brick maker. I always like that because it's you know, you, if you can have somebody making and selling the machines, then you can have other people whose business becomes to sell the bricks, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so that sort of thing that um, really interests me. Yeah, um, that's ready. Yeah, for I'll. I'll I mean, that's ready for prime time. The latest on that was we were working on a design of a soil mixer that gets the, s mixes the cement with soil and you can throw in soil in there for a perfect mix. Because the, the bottleneck right now is the quality control on the feedstock. So that's what we were addressing. Okay. You can do plain soil too, but we're talking about stabilized block right now that would be uh, rainproof. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There's, um, there's a guy I know, um, um, the most amazing engineer and entrepreneur mm. in a small town in Kenya who um, has built um, built brick making machines to his own design um, but I think that he um, I'd love to get how much is it does it cost like to buy the materials for, for one of the brick making machines four four to five thousand oh, okay right Huh. Yeah. You can do. You can probably do if you use lower power hydraulics, and you have like you could probably get it down to about three thousand if you're really clever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there's definite okay. costs involved. Um, is is the guy actually making block? Like a, this is for bricks, bricks that are fired, or what kind of bricks? They weren't fired, no. Um, like like Adobe block that are just formed, or no, um, it wasn't. No, I think it was more like um, it. It wasn't like a natural. Um, I think it was more like maybe some kind of a cement or concrete type thing that was setting. Um, I don't know, that doesn't sound uh, right. This is uh, too long ago be. since I was since I was there. I'm just going to try and look it up. Hang on. Um, Okay, he's. I've got, it's described as a block maker. The part about um, stabilizing with cement that probably makes sense because that's common. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I've got a load of photos, but I don't find them. Have the notes right here, but. Um, so you you were also one of the founders of Kumasi Hive. Yes, that's right. Is that are yeah. you involved with that a lot these days, or? No. Um, it, it's uh, it's going pretty well. Um, I I was only I was involved operationally for about a year year and a half, um, and then I was on the board for another two years, and then we were bringing in a load more local 
um, board members and it seemed a time to, to step back and it's now completely locally run um, and I'm not officially involved in any capacity. Yeah. I get occasional you know, informal updates, but that's it. Yeah. yeah. Um, like, for example, the guy, so the guy in Kenya with the block maker, I mean, is there interest in, do you think that actual block, stabilized block, like compressed earth, would be uh, accepted there? That would be something that would work? Because that's a definite case for a viable enterprise if somebody's an entrepreneur. The missing link is the people who actually take this, take the work on and actually go through the diligence of turning that into a viable business. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's the tricky part. Um, I mean, I've, um, I've done some work over the years with Tech for Trade. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they, um, yeah, made a, a 3D mm -hmm. printer um, to try and get people to set up businesses um, making and or, or using those and yeah I mean they've had some success but there's a lot of challenges in it um, in finding people I mean the um, like the skill the people who skill sets or mindsets more um, I guess skill I guess it's partly skill sets I mean I think it's hard to find people who have the combination of, of technical skill that's often needed to deal with an open hardware type um, product combined with you know business skill right yeah that's um, you know you can find you can find highly skilled engineers um, who can deal with the thing but yeah. then they're not they're not the yeah. people to, to make a business and sell it um, and yeah yeah it's it's a it's a tough nut that um, I don't have a good answer for yet yeah um, w what are are there any successful efforts that actually recycle plastic for filament making for 3D printing? Where is that? Where is the latest on that that you've seen the best example of? Uh, the best example of that is Tech for Trade. Um, they are the closest. So if this is if we're talking about PET. Um, so um, yeah, people, you can you can crunch up old prints, um, PLA. And, and re-extrude it. Um, lots of people can do that, but um, you know that's not something that's PLA isn't that's something that's readily available in waste plastic streams in most right. places. So the the holy grail is to get a machine working with PET. Um, so Tech for Trade have got by far the closest of anyone I've seen to to using um, to being able to extrude post um, consumer PET. Mm -hmm. Um, they are producing filament which has been used in test prints um, successfully uh, but they're still struggling with the consistency of the diameter um, of the filament produced mm -hmm. I think that's always one of the, the challenges um, we've this is something so I'm um, I'm actually not working um, as much at the moment as I would normally be. I've got some family stuff going on. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm keeping some things going and there's other things that I, w that I would really love to be putting more effort into that I'm not at the moment, but we'll pick up again in the future. Mm -hmm. So one of them, one of those is um, we last year started an effort we, to basically try and get together some more um, technical horsepower behind the the tech for trade effort because they've got mm -hmm. closer than anyone else and so joshua pierce and his group at michigan tech yep. um some guys at the university of lorraine um guys at university of oxford in the uk and bath and aston we, we've got a sort of the, a nascent group um who's interested on in you know trying to develop faster on this um this pet extrusion challenge um, and there's you know there's some things that are going so I know that there's, there's a team an instrument open instrumentation group at Bath are now working on a diameter sensor um, to give a you know feedback loop in for the um, the extrusion mm -hmm. but there's a lot more that you know there's other things that need to be done it just it's just stuff that needs to be picked up and in chunks and optimized you know like the feed oh, yeah. hopper getting that to feed consistently is really tricky and stuff like that mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's 
it's sort of hobbling along um, and I'm not doing much to galvanize it at the moment, but I would like to, when I have more time, I will do. Yeah, but yeah, yeah I, no, think, I think that's really important. I mean, for me, that's actually a game changer when it comes to making um, 3D printing viable in, you know, around the world. We're highly interested in that. So the latest for, from our side is I took a, basically do that through a, the shredder part. So we're looking mm -hmm. at taking the precious plastic shredder, but adding a, like a hundred dollar drive system to it instead of a two thousand dollar drive system to it. Okay. Taking a hundred watt motor, gear down. So what I've done here, the prototyping here was rubber belts and gear downs to get like a thousand fold. It's actually like ten thousand fold gear down from a okay. tiny motor, which takes the cost of the entire transmission down to a five dollar motor and 3d printed parts of rubber and plastic so that's so are you going for direct extrusion in. no this is just for shredding this is just shredding the the stock so i'm just okay. at the shredding step. so so the approach that tech for trade have taken for that is um mm -hmm. is actually really simple um mm -hmm. so they've done some experiments with different types of plastic and they've found mm -hmm. that um basically they're focusing on pet water bottles because you mm -hmm. can separate them you can find big producers of them and separate them out before they get it too dirty yeah. in general waste stream um big users of them sorry not producers so like collecting them from a hotel or something like that and then they've developed a machine that basically kind of cuts them peels it yeah yeah and, and and snips it so that you have a very consistent flake going in rather than a sort of rather than taking a shredder approach yeah. Uh, do you think that kind of a system w will scale or has the rates to be effective or yeah because well um i mean because taking one bottle at a time and that has to be so, highly like efficient because there's always um, so much material in a bottle it's that's not the bottleneck at the moment i would say mm. um i i can see that yes it would be good to find ways to scale that up but at the moment nobody's cracked the issue of no matter how well chipped or shredded the stuff is mm -hmm. how do you extrude filament from that yeah um i think that the the kind of um if you were trying to go into filament production as a business in itself then obviously you would need a you know a significantly scaled up operation if you were trying to have um a a 3d printing facility in a village that could enable production of spare parts when they're needed mm -hmm. um then something like that is actually probably fine mm -hmm. yep 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 uh what about all the there's a bunch of commercial pal pallet based filament makers i mean any of those capable of doing anything so what no, is the issue with not them? Not they, they don't. They don't work with PET. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's quite a soft plastic, um, and um, it's it's just r it's really hard. I'm not. This is you know this is well beyond the edge of my um, my expertise. But as I understand it. Um, it's really difficult to get it to extrude consistently. Um, it kind of sags as it comes out of the nozzle and creates an oval filament. Mm -hmm. And that that's the, the big problem that everyone has. Mm -hmm. I see. And what about, so P beyond PAT, like, like for ABS, let's say like, you know, car bumpers or whatever, ABS would not be available because that could be, there's... ABS is more widely available, but there's there are um, it's not something I've looked into as much. But I think there are quite some problems um, in terms of printing with ABS as well. Yeah, no, um, with uh, with the extrusion, I think um, I don't I don't know as much about that. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah, know that's, that's but, I, but I'm, I'm not fam I'm not familiar with anyone who's you know doing something there that's that seems close to being able to be deployed. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 got huge potential there once this is figured out. Um, is the, like, I'm, I'm wondering, like, why hasn't this been figured out yet? But is it simply that technically difficult? It's just getting everything fine-tuned? It, it, it's technically difficult, and um, there hasn't been there hasn't been a sort of consistent focus on it. I mean, as mm -hmm. I said, Tech for Trade have got by far the, the furthest and mm -hmm. they are, you know, 
not well funded, um, mm -hmm. not, uh, you know, not with kind of huge development teams or, or anything. I mean, like, I'm, I'm sure that with a bit more, mm -hmm. you know, one of the university teams could have cracked this if they had had a focus on it. Yeah. for a few years but nobody yeah. has so i guess you know that's when i'm talking about this sort of collaborative group that's what i'm trying to create really is is a few different people who will put time into it to crack the problem mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what's the key to that is just the time like say on your part or like what do you see that so you, you need to secure some funding for that or what is what's the main block to that yeah it's it, it's both i mean it's uh, yeah university teams can only work on stuff that they're funded to do generally so yeah absolutely funding is needed but it's you know there's also a uh, sort of coordination needed between different people and you know sometimes I feel like part of my part of the useful stuff I can do there is just to kind of keep reminding people to put it in funding applications and things like that and yeah. and try and coordinate different partners to come together around a funding application that's going to take it in a useful direction yeah 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 well definitely highly interesting to us um, stuff like like PVC I mean that's abundant waste stock like from construction and stuff like that everywhere uh, of course it's got its issues but there's yeah there's quite aren't there some health and safety issues if you're trying to extrude it I seem to uh, remember there's not there few yeah, there are things. there are but I mean that's true for a lot of the plastics so you'd have to mm -hmm. include the filtering the air filtering part in there uh, as well yeah. so yeah, that's that's still there too. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So, so when I do, so when I do start to to try and get things moving again on that um, the PET extrusion efforts, are you interested yeah, in, in getting involved in that? Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. That's that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and are you interested in, in joining up the Internet of Production Alliance as well? Yeah. Yeah. I could do that. Awesome. Um, I'll yeah. I'll uh, send you some information about the um, sort of overall aims of the alliance and things, what we're trying to do. But yeah, from yeah. some of the things that we've been talking about, I think it's uh, I think it's a fairly good fit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, Anna, so thank you, thank you for your time, and yeah, let's continue Pleasure. talking about this. Absolutely. See what we can do. Okay. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Great. Take care then. Bye bye. Bye.